Uh, this first poem is an homage to a great American poet named Muriel Rukeyser. And uh, I have an excuse for reading it because her work is going to be finally published in England uh, by uh, Blood Axe Press um, in the fall. Uh, so, um, and um, she was a poet, political activist, um, uh, everything, everything, from, everything from the Spanish Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement in the, in the, in the United States to the rights of uh, writers uh, around the world. Uh, and this is called Premiscule with Muriel, with the tip of the head, of course, also to Thelonious Monk. Instead of a cup of tea, instead of a milk silk whelk of a cup, of a cup of nearly six o'clock tea time, cup of a stumbling block, cup of an afternoon unredeemed by talk, cup of a cut brown loaf, of a slice, a lack of butter, blueberry jam that's almost black. Instead of tannins seeping into the cracks of a pot, the void of an hour seeps out, infects the slit of a cut I haven't the wit to fix with a surgeon's needle threaded with fine gauge silk as a key would thread the cylinder of a lock. But no key threads the cylinder of a lock. Late afternoon light, transitory, licks the place of the absent cup with its rough tongue, flicks itself out beneath the wheel's revolving spoke. Talk thoughts gone with a blink of attention, slack, a vision of death and distance in the mix, she lost her words, and how did she get them back when the corridor of a day was a lurching deck? The dream life, logic encodes in nervous ticks, she translated to a syntax which connects intense and unfashionable politics with morning coffee, Hudson sunsets, sex, then the short circuit of the final stroke, the end toward which all lines looped out, then broke. What a gaze out the window interjects on the southeast corner, a black lab box, tugged as the light clicks green toward a late day walk by a plump brown girl in a purple anorak. The Bronx bound local comes rumbling up the tracks out of the tunnel over the West Harlem blocks whose windows gleamed on the animal warmth of bricks, rouged by the fluvial light of six o'clock. And uh, these the, seem uh, to be very happy to see two children here on this night, not nice afternoon, uh, are um, uh, two, uh, two short talks, two sonnets, in fact, that I wrote uh, for or about uh, my daughter who uh, just got out of medical school but was about 10 years old at the time. <laughs> Uh, and they were they were written in they, uh, they were written in in Vos and they get in southern France where we were at the time. Now that she reads in bed till 10 p.m., she does by the dim pillow laps of hotel rooms in old towns whose names she cannot spell, with walls around, churches centering them. She won't go in museums but will scale any Romanesque or Gothic pile, racing term-ending outings of French school children sharing stretched possibles, a real duke's birdcage dungeon straddling the South Tower, the sacristan's maquette beyond the bell of vineyards, dollhouse fortress on a hill, shadowed by pensive monsters who aspire to the lady's intercessive smile as boats head slowly elsewhere up canal. And the second one after she'd gone away. Back, back across the ocean. She marched away, tagged unaccompanied minor, and idiotically, I felt like weeping, although I didn't get any work done for two weeks except mornings when she was sleeping late, her round brown face through dirty hair clear as a chorus, and for once, not talking. I tried to scribble at the town pool where she swam, fair days or foul. 
Incessant walking up steep hills on the back streets, firmed up by calves, lengthened by wind, and kept by blood pressure down. I needn't eat only where pizza is served or stockpile lemon, limonade and treats, a slight recompense. French kids on holiday will hog the pool, and already I miss her. And um, this, uh, uh, this is a hazel, uh, a form that comes to us from, especially from or Urdu and Farsi. Uh, and this one is for my f good friend, uh, the poet Mimi Khalvati, whose work I'm sure many of you know. For, uh, I've practically never given a reading in England and not found someone who hadn't been in, been in a course with Mimi, if not. Uh, <laughs> So this is a hustle for written for me, and it's called In Summer. The air thickens already more, in ha already more than half in summer. At the corner cafe, girls in t-shirts laugh in summer. The city streets, crowded with possibility under spring rain, thin out, don't promise enough in summer. That urge to write one's life instead of living it makes sentences slip limply off the cuff in summer. Slipped in a drawer under an expired passport, curly head in an orchard smiles for a photograph in summer. Hard case on the street, teacher out of class both harbor a low-grade fever and productive cough in summer. Espresso winter Springtime of Julianas, black tea with honey is what I'll quaff in summer. Despite my wall of books and Bach's geometry, some scent wafts from the street to call my bluff in summer. Not in a tank, but a golf cart rides the oligarch. However, he does not dismiss his staff in summer. Let them not in Maryland's name or Mariam's block any, any cindered city off a of breath in summer. And uh, this seem to be reading poems for poets, and why not? And uh, this one is uh, a glosa, which is a poem, a Spanish form, in which one takes four lines from another poet's work and builds up four stanzas, each one ending in one of those lines. Uh, and this poem is about the Russian poet Anna Akhmatova, and the four lines are from a poem of hers called Willow in Judith Hemschmeyer's translation. And the, 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 what happens in the poem is much about what happened to Anna Akhmatova, uh, forced during, uh, when her work uh, was banned uh, to write things um, Burn them by heart with a friend, and then burn them so that there would be, so that there wouldn't be any evidence of the world around. And one of his lines are, "And I grew up in patterned tranquility in the, in the cool nursery of the new century, and the voice of man was not dear to me, but the voice of the wind I could understand. A silent wind presaged a latish spring." There, birches leaned and whispered over the gravel path. Only the river ever left. Still, someone would bring back a new sailor midi to wear in the photograph of the four of us. Sit still, stop fidgeting. Like the still, leafless trees with their facility for lyric prologue and its gossipy aftermath, I like to make up stories. I like to sing. I was encouraged to cultivate that ability, and I grew up in pattern tranquility. In the single room, with a greasy stain like a scar from the gas fire's fumes, when any guest might be a threat, and any threat was a guest from the past or the future. At any hour of the night, I would put the tea things out, though there were scrap leaves of tea but no sugar, or a lump or two of sugar, but no tea. Two matches, a hoarded cigarette, my day's page ash on its beer in a bed sitter. No godmother had presaged such quaint nights to me. 
in the cool nursery of the young century. The human voice distorted itself in speeches, a rhetoric that locked locks and ticked off losses. Our words were bare as that stand of winter birches, while poet tasters sh sugared the party bosses' edicts, the only sugar they could purchase, with servile metaphor and simile. The effects were mortal, however complex the causes. When they beat their child beyond this thin wall, his screeches, wails, and pleas were the gibberish of history, and the voice of man was not dear to me. Men and women, I mean, those high-pitched voices, how I wanted them to shut up. They sound too much like me, little machines for evading choices, little animals selling their minds for touch. The young widow's voice is just hers as she memorizes the words we read and burn, nights when we read and burn with the words unsaid, hers and mine, as we watch and are watched, and the river reflects what spies. Is the winter trees rustling a code to the winter land? The voice of the wind, I could understand. And uh, this is a, a poem from a sequence of poems uh, that were <coughs> built in one way or another around the Hans Christian Andersen story, The Snow Queen. Um, and uh, this poem is called The Ruin of the Finland Woman, and some of you may remember that the Finland woman is a kind of good witch who lives at the uh, border of the North Pole, and the heroine of the story named Gerda arrives riding a reindeer who can talk. Um, the reindeer says to her, you are so wise you can bind the winds of the world in a single strand, why don't you help her? And the good witch says, as good witches will, she's come this far on her own, she'll have to help herself. <laughs> uh, but the story that is graded into this is that of my friend Shara Kari, now dead in Hungary, uh, who uh, was in the resistance during, the, uh, during World War II, helped save the lives of hundreds of orphans, some of whom were orphans and some of whom were the children of deported parents, um, later spent some time in Siberia for being the wrong kind of communist, uh, that is to say a Trotskyist, uh, but uh, she survived and uh, lived into her 80s to be honored and also have a career as a writer, translator, journalist. So this is called The Rune of the Finland Woman. She could bind the world's winds in a single strand. She could find the world's words in a singing wind. She could lend a weird will to a muddled hand. She could wind a willed word from a muddled mind. She could wend the wild woods on a saddled hind. She could sound a wellspring with a rowan wand. She could bind the wolf's wounds in a swaddling bag. She could bind a bad book in a silken skin. She could spend a world war on invaded land. She could pound the dry roots to a kind of bread. She could feed a road gang on invented food. She could find the spare parts of the severed dead. She could find the stone limbs in a waste of sand. She could stand the pit cold with a withered lung. She could handle bad tongues in the slang she learned. She could dandle foundlings in their mother tongue. She could plait a child's hair with a fishbone comb. She could tend a coal fire in the Arctic wind. She could mend an engine with a sewing pin. She could warm the dark feet of a dying man. She could drink the stone soup from a doubtful well. She could breathe the green stink of a trench latrine. She could drink a, a queen's share of important wine. She could think a few things she would never tell. She could learn the hand code of the deaf and blind. She could earn the iron keys of the frozen queen. She could wander uphill with a drunken friend. She could bind the world's winds in a single strand.
this is not um, uh, yeah, this is uh, th this is another another puzzle just because uh, Mimi and I are both very fond of them. Um, uh, and uh, this one is in uh, in, in, in memory of the Urdu language poet Faiz Ahmed Faiz, because uh, once when asked what is poetry, he said poetry is what's left after the loss of the beloved. And in the Hazel, the same uh, it's made up made up made up of couplets, but they don't necessarily have to be in this, about the same thing. And sometimes the same signifier. In this case, the beloved uh, can refer to many different things. Lines that grapple doubt, written because of the beloved. When grief subsides, what survives the loss of the beloved? Your every declaration is suspect. That was at least the departing gloss of the beloved. Were you merely a servant of the state, or now you give the coin a toss of the beloved? How pure you were, resistant in an orchard, peace with justice, the cause of the beloved. A scent of hyacinth clings to your fingers, of sap from a broken leaf, of moss of the beloved. Ambiguous predators howl within earshot. You would like to curl up between the paws of the beloved. Now uniforms cite scripture to erase you. Only rabble and vermin die under the laws of the beloved. Who signed the warrant that sealed you in this cell? Who read your messages? Who was the boss of the beloved? How pure you were, how abject you are now, waterboarded after the double cross of the beloved. You were promised release on the recognizance. Will this be a redemptive clause of the beloved? And I will read one more poem. repeats old news, arrogance, ignorance, war. A cinder block wall shared by two houses is new rubble. On one side was a kitchen sink and a cupboard. On the other was a bed, a bookshelf, three framed photographs. Glass is shattered across the photographs. Two half circles of hardened pocket bread sit on the cupboard. There provisionally was shelter. A plastic truck under the branches of, of a fig tree. A knife flash in the kitchen, merely dicing garlic. Engines of war move inexorably towards certain houses, while citizens sit safe in other houses, reading the newspaper, whose photographs make sanitized excuses for the war. There are innumerable kinds of bread brought up from bakeries <coughs> baked in the kitchen. The date the latitude tell which one was dropped by a child beneath the bloodied branches. The uncontrolled and multifurcate branches of possibility infiltrate houses, walls, window frames, ceilings, where there was a tower, a town, ash and burnt wires, a graph on a distant computer screen. Elsewhere, a kitchen table setting gapes where children, bred to branch into new lives, were culled. Who wore this starched, smocked cotton dress? Who wore this jersey bla blazoned for the local branch of the district soccer team? Who left this black bread and this flat gold bread in their abandoned houses? Whose father begged for mercy in the kitchen? 
Whose memory will frame the photograph and use the memory for what it was never meant for by this girl, that old man, who was caught on a ball field near a window, or exhorted through the grief a photograph revives? Or was the team a covert branch of a bad group? Were maps drawn in the kitchen, a bomb thrust in a hollow loaf of bread? What did the old men pray for in their houses of prayer? The teachers teach in schoolhouses between blackouts and blasts when each word was flensed by new censure. Books exchanged for bread, both hostage for the happenstance of war. Sometimes the only schoolroom is a kitchen. Outside the window, black strokes on a graph of broken glass, birds line up on bare branches. This letter curves. This one spreads its branches like friends holding hands outside their houses. Was the lesson stopped by gunfire? Was there panic, silence? Does a torn photograph still gather children in the teacher's kitchen? Are they there meticulously learning wartime lessons with the signs for house, book, 